All right, I want to talk a little bit about what we saw uh, on Tuesday night in Los Angeles yeah. with the Lakers. That big moment where LeBron and Bronny James shared the floor. Four minutes to go in the uh, second quarter. Both of them check in. It's the first time in NBA history that we have a father and a son sharing the floor at the same time, much less sharing the floor uh, on the same team. It was cool. The Griffies yeah. were in attendance. It was nationally televised. It got a good pop from the crowd. Um, I think it happened at exactly the right time for, for J.J. Redick because they were up by 14 at that moment, yep. so there was no chance yep. that they could kind of let the game slip away. He played two and a half minutes. He got one shot off. You had your I mean, I, I thought as orchestrated moments go, Rachel, that kind of went as good as you could ask for. Like, the only thing that would have, I think, made it better is if I, – I, you probably caught it, but, like, when – they tried to play a little two-man game with LeBron and Bronny. Yeah. Bronny made that back cut kind of there and Joe yep. Ingles read it and, and yep. sort of stepped in. Like, that would have been a cool moment. But overall, I thought it was fine. I've been a little bit surprised at some of the blowback from it. Like, people saying, like, who cares? It's nepotism. All the stuff that got drug, uh, dragged up back when Bronny was drafted. Like, what would, what was your takeaway from that moment with Bron and Bronny sharing the floor? Yeah, I mean, two things. First of all, I just want to give advice to all listeners, watchers, viewers out there. Um, if you say who cares, we know you care. So if you actually don't care about something, don't take the time to write in the comments who cares. That's just a little tip for me to you because you're telling on yourself. That's all I have to say. Look, I think there are things people will complain about all of the time. I think there are people who feel that, you know, this, this has been a culture more of general nepotism. I think over the last 10, 20 years in our culture, that's become more of a thing. And I think there's some frustration with that overall. So we're feeling that. I think that people criticize what LeBron does all the time anyway. There's people who don't like him. So I think there's a whole contingent of those people. I think that's where all that blowback comes from. And look, people can feel how they want to feel. I'm, I'm not here to tell you how to feel. It's sports. It's fun. You're allowed to hate the team that's your rival. You're you're allowed to hate that Bronny is in the NBA. That's your call. But I think it's a great story. I think that it's a really nice moment because it's not costing anyone anything. The problem for me would come if he was playing 20 minutes a game, if they kept him up all season when he clearly might belong in the G League, if they drafted him with a top draft pick when they could have spent that on someone else. Let's not pretend that middle to, you know, middle round, second round draft picks are so valuable and that most of the players who they pick, who teams pick with that are, become some elite. You know, we obviously get some rare occurrences, but they're rare for a reason. If we look at last year's draft pick in his position in that exact same spot, I think he played one minute collectively in the NBA for the entire season. So pretending that taking Bronny with that pick, pretending that playing him for two minutes when they're up 14 in a game they ended up winning, like is costing something and is unfair and someone else could be doing something more in that position. Let me tell you, most of the time, people don't do more in that position. They're in the G League that first year. So I, I just think all of that reasoning and hysteria has to stop. It's not true. It has no basis in fact. If you don't like it because you don't like it, that's okay. That's enough of a reason. You just don't like it. That's okay. The other stuff is not okay because it's not true. So I, I thought it was, I happen to like it. I thought it was a nice moment. I met LeBronny James Jr. as a baby. This is the first time, Chris, I have covered anyone I knew as a baby in the NBA. <laughs> that is a weird moment. But as someone who has seen him grow up, and I think it helps that he is such a good kid. I think that really gives him a lot of credit around the NBA and on his own team and in that locker room. If he came out with this air of entitlement, I'm LeBron James' son. I deserve to be here. I'm not going to really put in the work. You know, just sort of overconfidence. I think that would rub people the wrong way. But anyone who's been around him can tell you he's a super humble kid. He works really hard. He's super polite. He's deferential to people older and more experienced than him. He's the kind of presence that you do want around. So I'm happy for him. I'm happy for them. Clearly, it's supercharged LeBron in this season. He's happier and he's got more energy than I've seen him in a couple of years. Um, so I think that's great. I think that J.J. Redick and the Lakers will continue to handle this well. I mean, you just said they orchestrated it perfectly. I think that they will find the appropriate time to send him down to the minors to get the development that he needs. So it will all be appropriate. And, and by the way, I love that the Griffies were there. I thought that was really special. Ken Griffey Jr. was at LeBron's first rookie game. Um, I, they probably mentioned that on TV. We, we were there. So I don't I don't know what they said on the, on the broadcast. But um, I did have a, another surreal moment because I covered – Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, when I did a lot of baseball. And so I walked up, we said, hi, you know, we were chatting. And then he called his son over. He's like, Rach, he's like, this is Trey. He's all grown up now. And then he turned to Trey 
and he says, Trey, this is Rachel. She's the one I handed you off to when you were four years old at the 99 home run derby. And I was like, oh, good, because I didn't feel old enough watching Bronny mm-hmm. James out there. Thank you very much, Ken. So there we are. So that was my evening. In addition to watching Anthony Davis shoot the lights out, I got to feel like I'm 72, which I'm not, by the way, just for the record. The, you are not. The The circle of life, though, is, is <laughs> it's, fascinating. It's right there. <laughs> Right, right there in front of you, multiple players, multiple sports. It's, it's, it's interesting to watch at this point. So what is Underdog? Underdog is the place to play if you're a sports fan looking to win money while watching sports. With over 5 million happy players and $2 billion won, Underdog makes it fun and easy to cash in on all your favorite athlete performances. Compete against players just by selecting higher or lower on two or more player stats and you could win up to 1,000 times your money. It's 1,000 times. So turn every slam dunk into a win with Underdog. Think Kevin Durant will rack up higher than 30 points this week? James Harden will get lower than 10 assists? Cook up some entries for shots to win real cash prizes all basketball season long. They've got all your favorite leagues, teams, and stars to choose from. Create entries with all basketball picks or mix and match across your other favorite sports. Underdog is the place to play Pick'em, so sign up and deposit now and use promo code OPENFLOOR to get up to $1,000 in bonus cash instantly. That's right, $1,000 in bonus cash instantly. This week, I am going to be looking at all things Victor Wembanyama, who I think is going to have an MVP caliber season. He's got Chris Paul as his point guard. He's probably going to be Defensive Player of the Year, both ends of the floor. I'm going to be looking at Victor Wembanyama's numbers. So download the app today and use code OPENFLOOR to get up to $1,000 in bonus cash instantly. Must be 18 or over, 19 plus in Alabama or Nebraska, 19 plus in Colorado for some games, 21 plus in Massachusetts and Arizona, and present in a state where underdog fantasy operates. Terms apply. Void in Colorado. Concerned with your play? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.ncpgambling.org in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP, 1-800-639-8783, or text Next Step to 53342. In New York, call the 24-7 Hope Line at 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. This moment w- was going to happen at some point. I thought it was smart for the Lakers to make it happen right now on opening night. Because if it didn't, we'd be talking about when it was going to happen. And if Bronny James is going to have a chance to develop into an NBA player, and I think you and I would both agree, it's it's it, there's no guarantee there. Like there, there's okay. a, you know, it's going to be a tough hill for him to climb. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to have to do it by competing at practices, mostly I think in the minor leagues. We'll see if he goes down to South Bay and plays some minutes when their season gets started. That's probably the best for his overall development. He doesn't need this kind of hanging over his head. You know, mm-hmm. every regular season game. You don't need to be on like a road trip in Memphis and wondering if like Bronny was going to play with LeBron. Would this be the moment? Just do it now. National yeah. TV. You got the Griffies. Yeah. You got the whole spotlight. You play two and a half minutes and then it's over. Like if Bronny yeah. James, I wouldn't be surprised if Bronny doesn't play another minute for the next couple yeah. of months, right? Like yeah. he, he's, he's just not, look, he's not as good as anyone in their top eight. Right, he's not yeah. their best rookie. That's for sure. No. So, no. Um, I-, I thought the Lakers handled it uh, really well. To your point about his attitude, I think that's an important part to this as well. Like, yes, he he's had many, many, many advantages being the son <laughs> of LeBron yeah. James. But when you are the son of a superstar and the son of someone super wealthy, the motivation to be as good as that person at their respective sport, very often it isn't there. The fact yeah. that Bronny, who doesn't break the bank when it comes to physical tools, six foot one, mm-hmm. good athlete, doesn't play point guard, so there's, there, he's got some limitations there, a ceiling there. The fact that he worked himself into an elite college prospect, that he turned himself into a reasonable enough NBA prospect. Look, there were NBA sc- scouts that before you know Rich Paul went on his campaign saying don't draft Bronny, like they were considering right. him in the second round of the draft. They wouldn't have given him a three-year guaranteed deal, but they would have drafted him, I think, somewhere in the second round of that draft. He he turned himself into 
an NBA level prospect when he didn't have to. He had a near death experience like 16 months ago and he right. came back from it and played basketball once again. I don't know about you. I wouldn't have been playing basketball. I wouldn't yeah, have. If I had collapsed you on a to. basketball, you step for the rest of your no. life, right? Hell no, I wouldn't have been playing basketball. I would have gone and become like an agent. I would have gone work for Rich Paul and like, yeah. you know, taken that career path. He deserves, if you want to criticize, you know, anyone, if you want to say he doesn't, he's not going to be an NBA player, fine, whatever. I, I, I can see that. It is tough for a six foot one combo guard to make it in today's NBA. Not everyone can be Davion Mitchell, but yep. you can't criticize his work ethic and you can't criticize what he's put into the game. I, I think that that is certainly to your point has helped him, uh, you know, ease some of the blowback that's uh, come with his arrival. As far as the Lakers go, though, um, did you learn anything new about them on uh, yeah. on Tuesday? I mean, Anthony Davis picked up right where he left off. Uh, I thought the defense was pretty good, really good. Uh, they want to shoot threes. They didn't make a lot of them in that game against Minnesota, but, uh, you know, that's clearly going to be a big part of J.J. Reddick's offensive philosophy. What did you learn about the Lakers watching them in the opener. Yeah, I would say Anthony Davis more than picked up from where he had left off. It's funny, since J.J. Reddick got hired, the thing I have said over and over again is, I don't know for sure what kind of coach he's going to be, because who could? We, we just don't have any evidence until he starts to coach for a few months here. But I know one thing. The person who will benefit most from this coaching change will be Anthony Davis. Because to me, he is the most untapped superstar in the NBA. I think a lot of people who have reached his level in terms of what they've won, uh, how they played, the points they've scored, how dominant they've been at times during games, are sort of, we know who they are, especially at this point in their careers. Anthony Davis, to me, has always still had that room to go up a level, which is kind of scary. And it's sort of a little sad at one point, it felt to me like, huh, that he's just not going to get there and he has the potential to get there. And, and that's a bummer, man, because I know he works hard. Uh, it just didn't feel like either he or his coaches, and I think it's probably a little of both, put him in the right place to succeed in the right way and sort of had him focus on the right things. And I was like, wow, it's amazing to be as good as he is and still have that maybe maybe even like 20% room at a late stage of your a later comparatively stage of your career to still have that room. And J.J. Reddick is going to find that room. Because I don't know how J.J. is going to deal with an in-game moment he's never seen before. I don't know how he's going to deal with the locker room dynamics that they're losing for a while. But I know that he is a student of the game. I know that his X's and O's are sharp. And I know that he has spent a lot of time thinking about how to maximize Anthony Davis. And I think we are going to see it this year. And that's what some of the difference is with the Lakers overall that I would project is going to possibly put them a little more in the mix this season. I certainly would not call them a championship favorite in the West. But I would say that I think that they are going to be competing more in those high-level games because, yes, they're returning basically the same roster they had last year. Hopefully, they'll get a little bit more health around the margins for that team. And then also, I think Anthony Davis is going to be a lot better. And as JJ says, he believes in math. We saw that in terms of their attempts the other night. And hopefully, the threes will actually fall and they will be a different style of team as well. So I'm excited to see what they are. I'm not going to sit here. You know, you and I are both in L.A. right now. I'm not going to sit here like some of the fans were after night one being like, that's it. We're winning the title because, you know, Lakers fans. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I definitely am encouraged that that they're going to be more interesting. And Anthony, I love seeing really talented players succeed. I think Anthony Davis is going to really succeed this year. And that's going to be really fun for everyone who likes basketball. Yeah, great start. Uh, I thought Rui Hachimura was excellent in that game. If he can maintain something close to that level of productivity, that's going to be a big plus. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Gabe Vincent didn't do a lot uh, in the opener, but I think he's going to no. be productive for them off the bench. Hopefully, eventually, they get Jared Vanderbilt back to be a defender. Dalton Connect, the fact that they could play him for 16 minutes is a good yeah. sign, right? I, I was... Yep. Definitely concerned about the kind of liability he would be defensively. He didn't show to be that much. At the same time, like I don't know how much of what the opener was about the Lakers doing things well and Minnesota just laying an egg, because they kind of did. Mm -hmm. Like they had yeah. no energy from the start. Julius Randle looked terrible. I love Hashimura like revealing the scouting report, basically saying like, "Well, <laughs> we know that Julius just stand around and watches sometimes. We're going to take advantage yeah, of that. We're going to do that. Yeah, I absolutely love that. So we'll see. Like you definitely, if you're going to take a lot of threes. You got to make a lot of threes. We're talking about Boston in a second. They make yeah. a lot of threes. They're just take it a lot. You can't go five for yeah. 30 from three-point range and expect to win many games. But I love that AD is 
is exactly where he is. I love that Hashimura did what he did. We'll see with, with JJ. Like, JJ, I'm a little more skeptical of JJ than others. Like, to me, he's kind of the human embodiment of a Twitter... Because he's, okay. he's like the human embodiment of a Twitter algorithm, right? Like, everything he says is like where, like, Twitter is leaning sometimes. Like, even like the... <laughs> like, it, it's it's little thing, but like... I'm going to call the NBA about the basketballs. Do you think the NBA has anything to do with the basketballs? That's your own locker yes. room, dude. Like, that that's yes. your, that's your, <laughs> like, I don't think, I, I'd have to check, but I don't think they play, probably the biggest reason that the balls were new is I don't think, did the Lakers play a game at crypto in the preseason? I know they played the one, I, I forget. Like, I know I, they played the one. They played in Palm in, Desert. They played down, I think, in OC, right? So, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. So, if they did like, or that's. Not. Probably the reason, like they don't. It's not like baseball. They don't unpack new baseballs before every game, and you forget to rub them down. Like this is, it's it's not going to be a thing, right? Like that kind of little stuff right there. Uh, I, I think it's encouraging that he has Nate McMillan on his bench. It's encouraging he yeah. has Scott Brooks on his Daddy, bench. Like yeah. that all works for him. That's going to help him to something you brought up. Like the, you know, it, it's about managing the locker room, dealing with an eighty-two game season, uh, dealing with the time constraints. I was talking to Vinny Del Negro about this a couple of weeks ago, where. You know, he just said to me, he's like, there's just not enough time when you're a head coach. Like, you want to get yep. through four or five things. You really got to compartmentalize and get through one or two. And that will be considered a success. So we'll see how he handles all that. But great start uh, to the Lakers overall. Um, I do want to have one yep. quick thing on, on that. Yep. It's, it's interesting. Um, first of all, two things that he said relate to uh, the other night. First of all, he said they spent three days basically installing the game plan for this game, a uh, season opener, which is great, but you're not going to get that. Not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to be able to do that. And, and the point you make with the basketballs is I think what we're going to see, and we'll just have to see where it creeps in, his opening introductory press conference, right? He, he sort of, we all know, he swore, he was a maverick, he used, you know, bad language. This is what I'm what talking about, though, too. Like, the, 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 the that was clearly planned. Like, that was an course. orchestrated of curse. Of course. <laughs> it was, in fact, a little awkward. It was awkwardly <laughs> inserted because it was clearly planned. But the thing he didn't know and had to be told afterward was, hey, this press conference is being simulcast on local TV and radio. So you can't do that. That's a problem. But does he really he, not know that? He did three years of TV. I don't think he did. <laughs> I really don't think he did because that stuff's not simulcast Those on national TV Those cameras in the back? And radio, like the, like right? The, I don't know. <laughs> so, so I just think there's a lot of things like that, like the balls, like the this, like the that, and none of them so far have had an impact on, on the game itself. We'll have to see if one of those crops up, but but I'm interested. I'm interested to see if your skepticism bears out or everyone here's optimism bears out. We'll have to see. I just, look, it, it's not just with JJ, but it happens with every new head coach. It's like, wow, breath of fresh air. Like, this is what this yes. guy's doing. You're more prepared. Like, Darvin Ham wasn't a scarecrow standing yes. there on the sidelines. And I, I'm old enough to remember, just like you, a year ago when yes. Darvin <laughs> and Rob Palenka were arm in arm talking about how yes. awesome things were with that team. Yes. So yes. we'll see. We'll see. We the made the conference finals. Confidence in Darvin. I know. <laughs>